The peace of Christ be with you. I want to invite you. That is, I come bearing an invitation. An invitation that is as old as time itself. Time that was created in the one who creates time. An invitation to participate in the very life of God. For the next 22 minutes, I want to think about with you, explore with you, an invitation to participate in the revolution of the Spirit. It is an invitation that if we take seriously can unlock us from the presumed worlds in which most of us are trapped and so desperately want to flee. An invitation that can launch us to explore with freedom the wide open country of salvation. It is an invitation to a revolution. And by revolution, I mean a new paradigm of understanding reality. To not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. A whole new way to give our allegiance, orient our life in creation. A revolution that is guided by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the one sent from the Father and the Son. The Spirit that hovered over creation, the Spirit that was at Pentecost, the Spirit that rolls away the tomb, the Spirit that is in the deep down things, making the dawn fresh, the Holy Spirit. I believe that this world is charged with the grandeur that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that Holy Spirit is inviting us, drawing us into a new kind of life right now, today. For our time together, I have suggested three different marks of the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit is actively gathering a people. A Spirit is actually nurturing a people. And tomorrow we'll talk about a Spirit actually sending a people. Yesterday we talked about the Holy Spirit actively gathering a people to God. We looked at that Revelation vision on John on Patmos from Revelations 4 and 5 where there is a throne with one seated on the throne where all living creatures are pressing towards the center and the center holds. Right now, the Holy Spirit around the world is actively gathering a people. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is gathering a people so that the Spirit can be an agent of the Father and the Son to nurture a people. To nurture is what I wish to speak about with us today. To be nurtured is to be in an environment of care. To be nurtured means that we position ourselves to the conditions that will form us. The Holy Spirit is gathering a people so that that people, that community, might nurture us to be people who love Jesus, and by loving Jesus, obeying Jesus. But nurturing doesn't always come natural. It takes a lot of attention, and it takes a lot of patience. I'm a young father, which means that I've got young kids. I've got a four-year-old son and a 18-month-old daughter who is already her brother's equal. Ella, I love her so much. God has entrusted these children to me so that I might nurture them, care for them, provide all the resources I can to grow them up in the faith that one day they might join the ranks with you and gather singing holy, holy, holy. Nurturing requires an intentional commitment in an environment. I'd like you to come with me to Hope College on 10th Street, 129 10th Street to be precise. There's a little house there called the Keppel House where I have my study. If you come into the Keppel House and you walk up a flight of stairs and find room number two, that's my study. And if you come inside, you will find yourself surrounded by shades of green, two different colors of green. These walls are there to remind me of a daily prayer inspired by Psalm 1. Do you know Psalm 1? 
Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the paths that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, they meditate day and night. They're like trees planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf never withers, and in all that they do, they prosper. Sometimes I find myself just walking around campus, standing around like this, and people say, what you doing? I'm praying. What you praying? Lord, make us like trees. Make us like trees planted by streams of water. Now maybe it's because I'm a kid from the Pacific Northwest and my grandfather was a logger. Maybe it's because I was inspired by those giant Douglas firs that spiral to the heavens like steeples, but I've always had an affinity for trees. I painted my wall green in my study to remind me of a fundamental prayer. Lord, make us like trees. Isn't it significant that the prayer book of the Bible opens up with this picture of a tree? And I love that prayer because it reminds me that part of my job is to nurture young women and men in a community so that they might grow deeper in grace and taller in the glory of the risen sun. Trees are life-giving. They take in all the carbon dioxide of poisonous gas and produce fresh air. They provide shade for the weary, food for the hungry. And above all, trees remind us that discipleship sometimes is slow growth, undramatic. Lord, make us like trees that grow in the mystery between light and darkness that move gracefully from season to season. Make us like trees, slow us down so that we can attend to our place. I like that prayer and I painted my walls green to remind me that the work of nurturing is a work of the Holy Spirit that is outside of my control, but I am charged to help create an environment of care. And that care sometimes is patient which is not always what we think about when we think about the work of the Holy Spirit. Often, when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, we talk about the dramatic, the casting out of demons, the fiery tongues of glossolalia, the parting of the seas, the dramatic moments that sometimes spark and define a faith. And those happen and are happening right now all around the world. The witness of world Christians in all parts of the globe right now, is a testimony to the power and glory of the Holy Spirit in dramatic fashions. But that is not the only time the Spirit is at work. What I want to suggest to us today is that the Holy Spirit is actively working in our ordinary daily lives in such a way that if we can see it, that the ordinary becomes charged with the extraordinary. What I want to suggest to us is that it's easy to take for granted the Holy Spirit in our daily life, the life that we have just putting our lunch pail under our arms and going to work. I want to suggest to us that the Holy Spirit is actively involving us in his revolution, in our going to chapel, in our going to class, in our studies, in our friendships, in our hospitality, in our sleeping, in our rising. All of it so that we might be nurtured to be a people who love Jesus. And what does it mean to be a people who are nurtured to love Jesus? In John 15, John 14, verse 15, in the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus has his apostles, his disciples together. He's about ready to be betrayed by Judas, and he's giving his final charge, and he says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if you do, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth that the world does not recognize because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he will abide with you and be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. Jesus promises that he will send an advocate. He promises that he will send the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, to be with us when he is gone so that when the spirit is with us, Jesus is with us. And when we are with Jesus, we are with the Father. We are brought into the dynamic life of God. That is the extraordinary in the ordinary. 
and that there's a symbiotic relationship of nurturing to love Jesus by listening to Jesus, and in listening to Jesus, keeping his commands. Now, sometimes I'm worried that we talk more about Jesus than we do listening to Jesus. And so, for a few minutes, I want to invite us just to listen to Jesus. Because in listening to Jesus, we have the opportunity to hear him and obey him. And in that hearing and obeying, we love Jesus. And that is the work of the Spirit nurturing our life. I want to invite you to a mount overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where there's a sermon that Jesus offers. In Matthew 5, it begins this way. Hear this from the book that we love. Listen. It's amazing what we can hear when we listen. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up the mountain. And when he sat down, he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you or persecute you or say all kinds of evil against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to the entire house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that others might see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trodden underfoot. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will fall from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches others to do the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For truly I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders is liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. If you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So, When you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to the court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. And truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate certificate of divorce, but I say to you that anyone who marries a divorced woman, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord, but I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair, white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. 
You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to anyone who asks of you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you in the synagogues and the streets in order to be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret may reward you. And whenever you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand in the synagogues and in the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. For your heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites who disfigure their faces so as to show others they are fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not consume and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if the eye in you is unhealthy, the whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. A slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, and I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? So do not say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For it is the Gentiles that strive after these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is more than enough for today. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For the judgment you make, you will be judged. The measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye while that log is still lodged in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take that log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take that speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not cast your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and then turn and maul you. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for bread, would give a stone? Or if your child asks for fish, would give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? In everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For this is the law and the prophets. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many deeds of power in your name? And then I will say to them, depart from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because the house was founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains fell, the floods came, and that house fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one with authority and not as their scribes. It's a sermon on a mount overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's radical words. A whole new attitude of grace. Forgiving enemies indifference to things and to money. The kind of words that if we integrated into our life would give us a revolution, a countercultural perspective on how to live in this world and this creation. In my life, I found that sermon incredibly challenging and I'm an incredible failure at it. Because for most of my Christian life, I understood discipleship as a solitary effort and I failed to realize that God had given us an advocate, an advocate that was gathering a people, a people who were there to nurture me. For most of my Christian life, I saw the Christian way of discipleship as an individualistic effort, that I had to live this out. But what I wanna suggest to us is that you are not called to be individual, solitary beings trying to live out Jesus' life. The Holy Spirit, is nurturing you, but nurturing you in a community. And our time is running out, and I wanna leave us with this thought, that maybe, just maybe, the active sign of the Holy Spirit in your life is the community that God has pulled you into here at Wheaton. That maybe the dramatic, extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit that is nurturing your life to hear to listen and follow and obey Jesus is a space, an environment that is forming you to think and to be different. Maybe your administration and your faculty and your staff, all of the resources of this college bending together to nurture you to be a people so that you might grow deep in grace and tall in the hope of the risen sun, like a tree planted by streams of water. Maybe, just maybe, The ordinary things of your life, the community around you, is a sign of the Holy Spirit 
nurturing your life so that you might love Jesus more faithfully. I believe that's the case. I believe right now this gathering is a sign of the Holy Spirit. And as you go to class, as you listen to your professors, as you talk with your friends, as you explore the wonders and the quotidian mysteries of this world, you do so pulled in to the divine work of the Holy Spirit. As we close our time, can I invite you to stand with me? You've been such a good audience listening. Even you've got such good voices. And if you know this song, Drown Me Out Quickly, very quickly. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.